Everybody, round two of me going solo here for a YouTube intro. Got to talk to Marshall about his schedule. We have an awesome episode for all of you today. It is with Shira Frankel and Cecily Kang. They're both New York Times journalists. They just wrote a new book called The Ugly Truth, an inside Facebook's battle for domination. It's a lot about Facebook, which is after the 2016 election, kind of what the hell was going on in there. We have some good debates about what exactly is misinformation, whether the conservatives are biased against. We have a little bit of a disagreement on exactly Facebook's role and what they play in our society. It's a really fun conversation. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Let's get to it. Shira, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you for having us. It's good to see you. This was a difficult episode for Sagar and I to prep for on a couple different levels. So level one and the most important level is the book is great. So huge recommendation to all of the listeners to go check it out. There's been a lot of current events, social media reporting, and this book is definitely, I feel as if I can check out of Facebook for a bit now because I'm up to date on what's actually happening and what happened. So that's that's a huge plus. So that's why we want to talk with you all. But on the other hand, I just find myself not caring about Facebook that much. Obviously, the stakes are high. This is a company for trillion dollar market cap. The Big Blue app is one of the biggest, if not the biggest social platform in the entire world. At the same time, Facebook is not cool. I don't use it. It used to be the center of my social life. One of the funniest things you see on Twitter sometimes, you'll see people tweeting, man, remember when we had Facebook events, it was so easy to organize things. The, <laughs> AKA the presumption is that people who are tend to be in the up and coming 20, 30 something tech sort aren't using Facebook to organize apps. So can you just address the ambivalence that we're feeling, AKA we get the stakes, but on a personal level, I just don't find myself thinking about Facebook, the big blue app. We're using Instagram, obviously, but that's just where I want to start. Uh, I mean, it's a great place to start. And I, you know, we think of Facebook a little bit as a utility and it's hard to care about utilities, right? Do you care about your water or your electricity? You should, it's really important. And when it's not there, you notice it. Or when it gives you problems, you notice it, but otherwise it's just omnipresent in your life. And I think one of the things we try to say with this book is yes, care about this utility because this is a utility that is not being regulated, that has had a lot of problems in recent years, and it's arguably more impactful in your life. I mean, one other thing I'd add is that Facebook isn't just Facebook, it's Instagram and WhatsApp. And so even though in this book, we use the catch-all word Facebook, we're talking about its entire family of apps. The problems that we document didn't just happen on Facebook, they happened on Instagram and WhatsApp as well. And you know, with over 3 billion users across the world along those apps, you might not, you know, you might not do the thing we all did 10 or 15 years ago and poke people on Facebook and post your status updates, but one way or another, you're probably Facebook every day of your life. Yeah, it's fascinating because I definitely do use a Facebook product, or as Mark likes to remind us, Instagram by Facebook um, in his <laughs> recent edition. And yet, you know, it's interesting. I just built this new business, Breaking Points. It's a large YouTube following, Instagram as well. And somebody reached out and was like, hey, man, you should put this on Facebook. And I was like, nah, I just don't really care. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's just like I've seen too many people get screwed over also by Facebook in terms of media ventures to know that I would be an idiot for even trying to invest in it. Whereas if this was 2015, I would have been like, Facebook ads, watch Facebook time, Live. all these like fake <laughs> metrics that they used. Um, right. whenever all of that. So what do you think happened there with it? Did they burn their credibility, um, at the same, so they can both be omnipresent, but also not be within the zeitgeist. I'm just curious for what you guys think in terms of the company writ large and it's like relevance increasingly uh -huh. in the future. Cause I know this is what Mark spends all of his time thinking about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's incredibly relevant. I mean, I think it's hard. Like I, like you both said that you understand the how important and impactful it is and the consequences of all the decisions that they've made. But like, I think people need to hear like specific examples to really make it bring, to bring it home. And, you know, Ron Klain, the chief of staff of the White House recently was saying that whenever they, whenever the White House goes out and asks Americans, why aren't you getting vaccinated? Those Americans say something that is usually false. Like, oh, we heard that the vaccine does X, Y, and Z. And then the White House follows and says, 
well, how did you get that information? And he was saying that it was almost always on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just one example of the consequences. And so it is incredibly relevant, whether it's cool or not is, well, maybe not debatable, but it's not debatable. (laughs) It's potentially debatable. But I, I think to the point of like uh, that Shira brought up in terms of how many people it reaches around the globe, it is so important and consequential for people. And it's just like for many people in many countries, it is the internet. It is like the way they get on the internet. And so while in the US, we may have a very different experience uh, using Facebook or not using Facebook, and it is very relevant still here, it is still growing overseas. All the, I mean, it's the, the audience is saturated here in the US. Overseas is where all the growth is happening, and they continue to want to get into new countries where most people who do use the internet are using it through Facebook, and they may only use Facebook. Mm-hmm. One thing I'd quickly add to that is that what starts on Facebook spreads elsewhere. And I think a great example of that was the Stop the Steal movement. You know, in the day after the elections, a group was founded on Facebook to promote this idea that it had been stolen from um, President Trump. And not only did that movement go viral, it then spread to other platforms. And it really like brought together a coalition of people who spread all sorts of misinformation about the vote. And so we saw Facebook being a really, still a really powerful organizing tool with an ability to move people then across other platforms to WhatsApp and Instagram, but also to Twitter, to Gab, to all these new kind of sites. And, and it became a central place for people to then disperse to other parts of the internet. So here's here's my question on that one. We spend a lot of time here thinking about content moderation and more. Is that Facebook's fault? And I, 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 I'm not a Facebook shill defender. I've criticized them plenty. Isn't that, look, I mean, at the end of the day, Trump was the president and millions of people believe what he had to say. And Facebook is just a tool, like a utility that they use. Like, is it Facebook's fault that it started there necessarily and then went to Gab? Or is it just like, I mean, you know, in the 1990s, this would have been like on a AOL chat or whatever. And in 1980, it would have been, you know, at your Thanksgiving table, unfortunately, which we also still have to live with. How do you, how do you guys think about Facebook, mm-hmm. both as a extension? I, I don't know. I, I think of these companies and yes, they're important algorithms, all of that. But these are reflections of us uh, more than anything. Are well, they though? Are- are they a reflection? That's a good question. Okay. Are they a reflection of you when it's premised on an algorithm which is meant to surface emotive content? So one of the reasons Stop the Steal surfaced so high for people is because a lot of people were joining it. It was creating a lot of anger. It was creating a lot of frustration. Real, you know, it was feeding people these well, false videos, telling them that dead people voted. Which the more anger churned up, the higher up it was on your newsfeed. It would be the top item in your newsfeed when you logged in. I would make the argument that you know. For Facebook to have launched Newsfeed within the first couple of years without Mark Zuckerberg sitting down and thinking about it and saying, okay, I wanted to be a neutral platform, but I'm now launching an algorithmic device which will show people, prioritize one thing about another, I am no longer a neutral platform. I am making mm. decisions about what people see. And I'm I'm not trying to make the argument that they're a media company. I know that's, that, that there's books that have been written about that, but they're not a neutral platform either. There's something else that they they have not defined because it's good business for them to not define it. It lets them kind of put their hands up and say, well, we have some content moderation and we try, but we don't want to totally be responsible. And we can also absolve ourselves of some of this responsibility. And sorry, Cecilia, I think you wanted to add something. I was going to say, Cecilia, I know you have something. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not like this is a machine that's out of their control. Like we actually, you know, we started this project with maybe that question, is this kind of a Frankenstein, like a machine that just like went awry? There were decisions that were made. There were decisions to give face to give Trump a special carve out to make give him a protected class where he could violate all of the speech rules when it came to hate, inciting violence. And they would just assume that more speech and that people would like more speech would drown out bad speech and that that the public would basically fact check him. So there are decisions that are actually being made there. And those decisions have evolved over the Trump presidency, had evolved over the Trump presidency, that shows that actually it's not just something that could that's out of the company's control. And much many of these decisions are being made by at least, you know, a few individuals, but most and most certainly, and especially recently, one individual, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm glad you took it to the issue of Trump's performance on the platform because it gets to, 
I think the most interesting debate and post-op about Facebook's decision-making over the past five years, which your book is covering, because there's a lot of great examples. For example, the really creepy one y'all give about Facebook engineers having the ability to just stock their dates and how the company was just frankly very negligent in handling that. That's just incontestable. That was obviously, from my perspective, that's a, well, growth is important, but you know what's more important than growth? Not that. Just, that's just a, I think most people are going to agree on that. But when it comes to Trump, it's incredibly complicated. So for example, I get frustrated by the way people portray the debate over Trump on Facebook because eh, he actually is a world leader. And I know that it's true that the way they got to the whole newsworthiness thing was convoluted. But the reason why I think it was convoluted is because there isn't a clear answer from my perspective. Um, because once again, no one really knows quite what Facebook is. And I think we've all learned from social platforms, from Twitter to gab to everyone else. The second you define yourself in terms of what you're doing, so Jack Dorsey saying we're the free speech wing of the free speech party, that wasn't A, sustainable. He didn't quite mean what he meant when he said that. So once again, you know he'll just he speak to that issue. Yeah, so it, 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 that, that's more what, what I'm basically trying to articulate here is this point that I think when it comes to handling Trump on the platform, at least until January 6th, I think the situation is much more ambivalent than it is typically portrayed by people who typically are just partisan and were not seeing the actual use cases here. Yes. I mean, look, Trump is is complex, right? Because as you said, he's an elected leader. I understand Mark Zuckerberg's point of view that you want elected leaders to be heard and you want people to make their own decisions. And, and again, this just goes back to, I think, Mark not really understanding the way the world works. This is a person, just to, to go back to some of our early chapters in the book where we sketch out what how he started off. He's lived a very sheltered life, right? This guy has gone from pri- one of the most elite private boarding schools in America to Harvard to you know founding Facebook, immediately being successful. He is not a person, and this is people very close to him have said this, who intrinsically looks at the world and sees the dark side and the, the bad use cases, because why would he, given his life experience? Unfortunately, he's surrounded himself by people who always see that with him. And so when he looks at someone like President Trump, he doesn't imagine him writing a looting and shooting post. He doesn't imagine him sharing misinformation about COVID. That's not where the, the executive suite of Facebook, that's just not where they, they think ahead and look towards. And I think one of the arguments we make in this book is all they had to do is look at other countries, look at India, look at the Philippines. There were multiple places where this was happening before it came here to the United States, where populist leaders were using Facebook in order to spread content that lied to their own populations. So not have predicted or at least come up with a policy ahead of time of what they were going to do when you know Trump told people that disinfectants in UV light was going to cure COVID or treat COVID. You can make an argument that that kind of posts requires a label that is more than just go here to the CDC website to learn more about COVID-19 in America, right? Maybe that requires a label that says, this isn't true. Please don't drink disinfectant or treat yourself with UV light. Our doctors, you know, like, could Facebook have taken a stronger stance? They eventually came around and did it, but it was very late because they had to deliberate for weeks and weeks before they came to it. Here's the problem, though. Something I'm really proud of is the fact that we have a a very actually ideologically balanced show. So I know all of our right-leaning listeners are screaming at us for not bringing this up. So we'll just bring this up. The problem is half the country disagrees with what you just said. So my problem with the articulation of there are lessons to be taken from Duterte in the Philippines or X, Y, and Z things happening in Central Europe, because half of the country, and actually maybe this is a effect of Facebook warping what people actually believe, but at least when it comes to the public facing interpretations that political actors are supposed to actually intuit, like when Joel Kaplan is running Facebook's DC operation, he has to think of this. Half of the country and definitely Republicans in Congress would say, actually, no, that's just not Facebook's job. Actually, no, Mark Zuckerberg has nothing to learn from Duterte because Duterte is not an elected American elected official. And if they want to have a policy in the Philippines around disinformation and like literal violence, that's not our business. But in the US, we have this expectation, at least on a cultural level, around the quote unquote First Amendment. Obviously, it's a private company. But as we see, this debate is complicated because these are 
private organizations who can determine what they want to do, but it still comes into speech in the platforming part. I think Zuckerberg had an interesting articulation of like the fifth estate that y'all wrote about, which is that this is, it's, you know, the, the fourth estate is obviously the press, but the fifth estate are the actual users and the actual people. So what I'm just trying to struggle with, I would love just y'all's perspective, and it'd be great for you to bring in the players what their perspectives are on this issue. Because I think I'm articulating what Republicans are saying. How are people in Facebook itself responding to the whole idea of, nope, just not your not your job. Don't do it. Mm-hmm. You are the public square. Don't label it. We don't trust you. Love to hear what y'all think. Uh, so, so I'm in Washington and I cover politics and regulatory policy. I think it might be a little bit, there's a nuance there. Um, I think that the right in the US do not want medical mis- misinformation out there. They do not want harmful content. They agree actually in principle with some that there are some things that are that are just bright lines when it comes right. to speech. What they're concerned about with Facebook is this, this idea, this allegation that their voices are being censored, that they as political actors are being censored by a liberal company. Plenty of studies outside and inside that say that this is just not true. So it's a little bit less about what kind of speech that people think is appropriate and not. I think that there might be more agreement between the left and right on that. I think what they see is uh, they have the perception that there's a pattern of Facebook and other Silicon Valley companies censoring them. And that's what they don't agree with. I, so, and I think internally, <laughs> Facebook has not done itself any favors because it plays, it has played into the politics. And to your question about bringing in the political, the, the figures, Joel Kaplan, who is the head of DC operations, he's actually technically the VP of global public affairs. He introduced a lot of that and we show that. And it's because ultimately, and I think this is really important to tie this back to the business because of what the people in Washington do, the employees of Facebook and Washington do is to protect the business. That's what lobbying is all about, right? So from Joel Kaplan's perspective, if conservatives are saying, look, you're censoring us and this is a big problem, The read at Facebook headquarters, MPK, is Republicans are mad at us. And if Republicans are mad at us, we've just lost one of our best allies who believe in the free market and do not believe in regulation. This is the kind of calculus that goes to the minds of of the people within Facebook. So it's there's there's politics that are being played that I think are quite important that are beyond sort of like the the ideology and the legislation that we're talking about. I want to add you use the public square. I think that's one that a lot of people like to use, but it isn't a pure public square because what Facebook does is give certain people in that public square a megaphone. And that's what I want people to imagine, right? Like imagine if you were in a public square, but it's not that everyone's voice was equal. It's that some people's voices had megaphones and those megaphones tend to amplify misinformation. When you said half the country believes it, I would argue, you know, a lot more people believe misinformation about COVID because it came to the top of their news feeds, because Facebook pushed them into groups, which told them information that wasn't real, that otherwise I wonder how quickly they would have been exposed to that, how quickly they would have been, you know, exposing their own friends to that. I, I, I'm just going to give a, an example from my own life. I, I joined Facebook groups when I became a mother and I, the recommendation algorithm within one or two clicks was sending me into groups that encouraged mothers not to vaccinate their children. Um, I went and did my own research about that and came to my own conclusions, but that Facebook so quickly pushed me into that moment. I joined a single group for new moms, told me something about what it was, what their algorithms were surfing, surfacing is interesting and where they were, they were pushing me somewhere where they knew the content was very emotional, where I was going to respond in some way. And, and that's the key here, right? That's the key. The emotions are good for their business. It keeps you online more. It keeps you giving them more data. They are they are taking that megaphone into that public square and altering the conversation. And therefore, they need to be responsive to the aftermath of that. Shira, you used a very important word in this conversation earlier. You said the word utility. Um, and uh, Cecilia, you know, that plays right we're here in dc you and i uh so it's like that's this is all the rage this is the hottest conversation in washington is facebook utility um should it be broken up could you give us both two things a maybe a little bit of a preview because i think a lot of people saw that that case had been dismissed against facebook what exactly that means but talk about the people within the company themselves does mark zuckerberg believe facebook is a utility 
does Sheryl Sandberg believe that? And in terms of like, what do they actually believe? What are they publicly presenting to the public around all of this? And how should we evaluate that? So both of you, either who wants to take it, please do. Yeah, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg has himself said that he believes that this that Facebook is a utility, and he has also said that Facebook is is in many ways um, um, its own governance. You know, it's almost its own government. Like he's talked about these things in those kinds of terms. Um, internally, I think you know, I don't think Facebook views itself as a utility in the regulatory sense, mm-hmm. not like a telephone or. Um, or, or cable network or broadcast TV. These are the these are the kinds of things that are regulated right now in Washington. So it does not consider itself a common carrier um, because that would bring on a lot more regulation than it definitely wants. It it absolutely understands its role and it says that it wants to be um, that it accepts regulation. But what it's also said is we don't think that we should be responsible for creating rules of the road that are so strong internally. We want help from government. And I think that's a little bit of a frustration inside and even outside that, you know, okay, that might be true, but if that is the case, maybe you need to actually tap on the brakes a little bit. Like you would just continue to like push forward and push forward and enter new markets and try to enter new technologies, blockchain, for example, Libra pissed off of all of Washington because they're like, why are you trying to do something so disruptive that's going to like completely bust open one of the most regulated markets in the world, financial markets, given your track record, right? So Mark Zucker was brought up on the Hill to testify. I mean, I think that's the kind of frustration that people have here in Washington is that the company is moving so fast and continues to have growth as a, its key metric. It understands its power, absolutely, but it's not necessarily trying to do enough internally to fix it. I will just say, just to answer your other question really fast on, um, on breakup, look, it's going to take some time. I actually really think that something's going to happen, though. And the reason why is I've been covering this for a ton of time, a t- like many years, regulatory policy, and I've never seen the kinds of actions that are happening so quickly when it comes to legislation, when it comes to regulatory policies, when it comes to enforcement actions, i.e. lawsuits to break up Facebook and Google. Like this is just happening. It's like so much, so much velocity. And it's really been stunning for me to watch. I think if history is a guide, it's just a matter of time. It's not going to be fast, but Facebook will continue to grow in that time. So it's just a matter of where Facebook can sort of hedge to make sure that it is continues to be successful, given what they very well known is inevitable regulation. Got it. Oh, this is interesting though, because if history is a guide, I would take a different conclusion. My conclusion would be that my, this is Microsoft 2.0. So mm-hmm. for context, for listeners, obviously Microsoft in the 90s at its height of its power and arrogance was not... There's no Rohingya issue. There's no electoral issue. So once again, like the stakes, I'm not talking about stakes here. And I think y'all have done a really excellent job of articulating that. But that being said, Microsoft in the 1990s was, you know, they were they were the Death Star. They were the they were the big boy in the space. Uh, Bill Gates obviously just flushed us all down the toilet, but he had to spend 15 years laundering his reputation to no longer to no longer be known as this ruthless guy. Seriously, he really that's all that's all done now. But basically up until 2019, he'd had to spend so much of his time repairing everything. Mark Zuckerberg is going to probably follow the same playbook. The point is, eventually, this culminates in the world just kind of moving on because the issues that were at hand in the 1990s, you know, control of the Netscape browser, packaging the, you know, the software together with the actual um Windows software itself, they just weren't relevant because Google happened, all these different companies happened. And I'm just looking at the reality that Facebook is not, Facebook's, if you're, if you're in the spaces that we're in, Facebook's kind of a joke. So Facebook announces a newsletter, a newsletter platform program. Are any of us going to launch our newsletter on Facebook? We're not. That's just, it's just not, it's just not going to happen. I would actually much rather use Twitter than review with Twitter if you're not going to use Substack. Facebook launches a clubhouse competitor. It's instantly treated as a joke. Instantly. We're podcasters. We have a decently growing podcast. We're a good fit for this. They launch a new platform to increase podcast discovery. We literally do not care and think it would actually hurt us with our audience because it would make us look very boomer and uncool. So what I'm kind of getting at is from a competition and regulatory perspective, I don't 
have an easy time of seeing how we're not just going to have to move on having taken the hits that we took over the past five years in the same way that there were better decisions that could have been made with Netscape in the 1990s, but the world was just going to move on. So I would, I would just love to hear y'all respond to that. I, I will say one thing. Um, Microsoft is a little bit of a sleeper because it is also one of the most powerful companies in the world with one of the biggest valuations of any. Yes. So the lawsuit, you know, so the lawsuit did slow it down, but it has, I mean, it doesn't get the attention at all that Google and Facebook get, but it is a hugely powerful company, but it's a different company. It lost, it learned Sorry, a lot quick, of lessons in the process. Thing. Yeah. That's kind of the point I'm making though. Yeah. Yeah. My, 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 my point is that I, in 20, when we, let me just better articulate this then. Yeah. I think in 2030, people, especially Gen Z folks are going to think of Facebook the yeah. same way that I think of Microsoft. It's big, yeah. it's huge, it's everywhere, but no one's going to be running for office on breaking up um, yeah. Facebook the same way that no one was running on breaking up Microsoft after the Zoom debacle in 2007. Uh -huh. So sorry yeah. for the interruption. And I totally agree with you. And I guess my point is you can be uncool and incredibly powerful at the same time. Mm. It's just like, that's, that's the bottom. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, there was a point with Google where it was just so whimsical and interesting, the primary colors and the logo. And everybody was thinking like, this is just such a different kind of thing. And then it became clear to everybody, oh, it's kind of like GM. It's like this massive conglomerate, you know, and I just don't think about it, but I use search and it's really important, but I don't think that it's necessarily this cool and important thing. And I, I just think that when it comes to business and economics, it's really hard to see Facebook not growing because if you think of Google as the search, but the search company, if you think of Microsoft as the cloud company going forward, as well as Amazon and Amazon retail, Facebook will be communications. It's our phone. It's our video. It's our entertainment as well. It's so many things going forward. And I just can't see that, that trajectory changing, you mm -hmm. know? So, but yeah, so I think we're in agreement actually, Marshall, that yeah. it's like, you can be both. You can be totally like boomer. I'm sorry. I'm really close to being a boomer. So I'm not going to use that. I would say it's kind of close. You can be, you can be. Boomer's uh, a state of mind. That's more yeah, what I'm It is a state of mind. <laughs> okay. I'm in a boomer state of mind yeah. and, um, and be incredibly successful and powerful and threatening to other companies. Uh, here's my question, which Facebook has talked a lot about. And I think there's some validity to this, Shira or Cecilia. What about TikTok? I mean, TikTok has now surpassed, I believe it was yesterday, surpassed Facebook for the only company, what is it, to have surpassed like 3 billion downloads worldwide. They just surpassed Instagram for time on app, which, I mean, look, that's a tremendous achievement. I'm no fan of TikTok from a national security perspective, but it is what it is. Is there some validity then to the idea that social can be disrupted? Um, and I know that this is what Zuckerberg himself spends a lot of time thinking and kind of obsessing about, which is like, wait, how did we just get knocked off this pedestal? Right. I mean, as we know from our book, Zuckerberg was very upset about TikTok. He was very upset about their success. And, you know, he even used that as a strategy when he went to the White House, you know, mentioning it and saying, look, if you if you do anything to curb our growth, what you're also doing is, is handing a gift to TikTok. I think TikTok's fascinating, you know. You mentioned earlier that Facebook has launched this podcast platform. They've tried to get newsletters. They've also tried to launch a version of TikTok, right? The yeah. Instagram. I, I don't know about you. I haven't seen anyone making, I can't even remember what Instagram is calling Reels. them. It's Reels. Reels. Oh, Reels. 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 I was like, say its yeah. name. Don't leave I, it out. <laughs> my girlfriend uses Reels. it specifically because she won't download TikTok for national security reasons. Right. Not because she doesn't want it. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I get it. But I think anyone who has experienced both products will argue that TikTok is a much yeah. more satisfying and interesting user experience because they've attracted young creatives, right? They've attracted talent. And as you said, Facebook is no longer considered cool. So if you're 16 and incredibly creative, a dancer, artist, singer, performer, you, you go to TikTok to showcase what you're doing. You don't necessarily go to, 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 to Instagram or definitely not Facebook at this point, let's be honest. Um, what's interesting about TikTok is that, it, yes, it showed that you know, with the might of that of, of ByteDance, right, of the company that, that helped launch them, you can help disrupt Facebook. I think, you know, I think Facebook is very afraid of that happening. They know that 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 is probably going to continue happening and that they will not long, they will no longer be able to buy their competitors the way they did in the early days, the way they did with Instagram and WhatsApp, where founders were willing to be purchased by Facebook. And I, I think part of that is that founders saw what happened. 
mentioned, you know, Instagram was promised autonomy. WhatsApp was promised that, you know, certain privacy and security features that were dear to their hearts would be maintained. And the founders were were disappointed. You know, they left the company ultimately in both cases because Mark Zuckerberg looked them in the eye, said he was going to do one thing and then didn't didn't follow through. And so now if you're a young founder with a with a cool and dynamic product on the market, you're not likely to believe Facebook when they promise you that they're going to let you maintain your autonomy and, and, and you know, your creative standards and the things that make you great. They know that you're going to become Instagram by Facebook. I think the funny thing there, and obviously Palmer Lucky is his own very, very mm-hmm. unique case here. But the point is, from this 2013 to 2016 period, you have three very notable cases of major acquisitions with with founders not having a good time. I think if you go to all three of those, all, all five, I guess, of those uh, founders, they would not go back in time and make that decision over again. So that shapes it. So something that I want to really get across, because we've just taken it as a given that Facebook is just not cool. But I actually think this really matters. Can you, when was peak Facebook? Not from a um, oh, monetary perspective, yeah. right? Because once again, peak Facebook is this very second, given the market cap. Yeah. What I mean is, I think for Sagar and I, I we're, we're firmly yeah. in the camp that, you know, the social network was one of the best movies of the 2010s. And there was just, you know, you know, there was, there, there was something to that space. And there was going, when, when do you think peak Facebook of, of, of relevance, of coolness of all that happened? Because it's one of those things where it was, and then it just wasn't. So I'm, I'm just curious how y'all think about that. Oh, that's really hard. I was a really early hard. Facebook user. I, I went to school in Boston. So my school, I, I did not go to Harvard, but one of my school I was about to make the joke. I was like, is no. that just your way of saying like, oh, you went to Harvard? No, 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 no,
what people didn't realize in that moment was that everything they were posting online was going to be saved forever. I remember having a conversation with someone and I said, you know, are you afraid of, of police seeing what you're posting? And they said, no, well, Facebook, you know, everything you post on Facebook only lasts for a month or somebody else was like, oh, they, they only retain their data for a year and then it gets deleted. And I, I kept thinking like, why do you think that? Why do you think it's, it's ephemeral? Um, and then, you know, another person later on saying, well, well, you know, Facebook is an American company. They protect you. America has freedom of speech. So when you use an American company, the rules are different. Obviously, you know, years later when the military took over, when there was that military coup, I, I was in Rabba when it happened. And I remember so clearly thinking all of these members of the Muslim Brotherhood who have openly posted as being part of this group that is now being outlawed in Egypt are going to be arrested because of their Facebook posts. And that yep. is exactly what happened. Of course, they start with the LGBT groups. That, those were the first to get arrested by, by Egyptian police. And then they moved on to the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm sorry, I'm getting very in the weeds of the Middle no, East. No, no, right this now. is good. Yeah. No, people, people like something this. Something that Please, I'm very go. passionate. I'm very yeah. passionate about this. Um, and again, I, I people I'd known for years, people I was friends with in Cairo, were frantically trying to figure out how quickly they could delete their Facebook profiles and, and unfollow groups and how much data the company had retained on them. And there was this panic, like, oh, shit, Facebook's not going to protect us. We're not part of some American democratic experiment just because we're on Facebook, because actually the Egyptian police can see everything on this. And we didn't understand the technology that had been handed to us. And that's for me key here because it repeats in Myanmar in 2015. These countries that don't have the same type of media literacy that we have here in the United States, where the internet has not been a slow roll introduction, we're never given media literacy. Facebook initially didn't give media literacy in any of these countries as they launched. And so you you hand the population this amazing tool, but you don't tell them, hey, guess what? If your country is still an authoritarian dictatorship, be careful what you say here. Be careful. Yep. We will hand over data requests when asked. I want to, um, as we're nearing the end here, throw this to Cecilia to get your chance to talk about your specific feed, because I actually would, would love for you, there's perfect timing on this, to just unpack what happened w with the FTC and state attorney general's case. Um, you wrote, you, you had a great write-up um, on June 29th, because I, I just want to read something real quick, because in the first, basically the preface chapter, you sum up uh, New York state attorney general Letitia James' charges, which is basically that it reduced choices for consumers, stifled innovation, and degraded privacy protection. So there's this big lawsuit. It's thrown out yeah. initially by a judge last month. Just what what happened? What so yeah, just 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 give us the full explanation here. Cause I think that's um, the most relevant moving forward point here. Oh, totally. So um that was a huge victory for Facebook, obviously, right? But the judge in this case said, look, you have 30 days to refile. The judge essentially said you didn't prove that Facebook's monopoly well enough. So rewrite it, like show your homework is essentially what the judge said. And so really interestingly, the Facebook, the FTC is led by a woman named Lena Khan. She's the chair. She is a very, very well-known critic of big tech. And she's done a lot of academic research in law school, as well as led a house investigation of big tech. She's really been absolutely clear on her views that big tech is too powerful and needs to be like the focus of the federal government. So she is right now leading this effort to refile. The battle is absolutely going forward at the FTC and the courts and, and figure in in this attempt to sort of rein in the dominance of Facebook. Okay, so that's the effort of the FTC. It's gonna fight with, the, with Facebook. The courts are another matter. The courts have progressively over decades become more conservative when it comes to antitrust law. And what they've done is essentially prioritize with consumer prices. They say, look, if the price of sugar goes up, that's bad. There must be like some sort of anti-competitive practice happening, or in other words, like there must be or the reverse. So what is, how do you apply that standard to internet companies is the big question going forward. It's known as the consumer welfare standard. So how do you measure competition when Facebook is free, when Google is free, when Amazon products are oftentimes cheaper than other products? and people use Amazon for free. These are the big questions going forward. So even though there's like a ton of interest right now in Washington and the Biden administration to just like enforce, to go for these policing actions and file lawsuits against these companies, they're up against a more than century old law, the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act that are like just right now have not really 
progress much or modernize much for, for today's economy. So, yeah, it's really, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Marshall. No, I was, well, I was just, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious because that standard, that's like the ultimate question. And right. something we hear a lot, Cecilia, here in DC is the idea of a right left kind of unity. You know, you do see a lot of right wing praise for Lena Khan and all of that. But it does seem to me fundamentally irreconcilable in the critiques because at the end of the day, you know, conservatives want to repeal Section 230 or break up Facebook in order to mm-hmm. stop censorship. Whereas yeah. uh, people like Mark Warner, uh, Richard Blumenthal, you know, these other senators, Amy they Klobuchar. want Amy Klobuchar, they want a lot more censorship. So I'm like, I just, you know, I don't see how this could all come together at the end of the day in an actual enforceable action. What do you think? Uh, I mean, so. Also, about a month ago, the the House um, uh, the House Judiciary Committee passed a suite of antitrust bills. It would be like the most like radical change of antitrust laws in decades. If you were to ask me a year ago, even certainly two years ago, if that would have gone through and passed in a, in a bipartisan way, generally, um, I would have said no way. Like there's like nothing passes, first of all, in Congress. And there's just like there's too much disagreement. This is the Republicans are the party of the market. And, mm-hmm. you know, Democrats also are just like they they don't want to potentially do something that's too overburdensome and have you know these other unintended consequences. Um so that was actually a real sign to me that things have changed. I'm not saying things are going to pass quickly or easily on the, in the full House floor or the Senate, and you're going to see a complete sweeping change of antitrust laws. But I do think it's just a matter of time. And again, if history is a guide, let's forget Marshall, Microsoft for a little bit. If you look at history as a guide, when you look at the biggest antitrust actions of the past, um, past century, it just looks sort of inevitable that there will be some sort of change on from the outside with laws and regulations. So here's my big last question. I've been convinced of a lot of things reading your book and just from what you all are articulating here. I was once again to write leaning listeners, we can debate the effect of Russian interference on the actual election, but I think it's pretty clear that there was a lot of negligence at Facebook that led to there even being that debate in the first place. And that's something we could all acknowledge and recognize. I I get the privacy things. I just, given the fact that Sagar and I are deeply in these spaces, I am just not convinced by the monopoly point itself with Facebook's case, because the key thing, Lena Khan, she got famous, deservedly so, focusing on Amazon. And I think that when we say big tech antitrust monopoly issues, that actually does a little too much work in that it actually confuses the actual point, which is right now I see Facebook, I see TikTok, Twitter is now coming back, Clubhouse was never going to get bought by Facebook in the first place. They rejected Twitter's offer. I just don't, I'm, I'm concerned that our conversation around Facebook being monopoly, and this is maybe where the judge is coming from, is just stuck in a brief really negative moment from 2013 to 2016, where Facebook just had the perfect mix of utility power and coolness to do that. As in, wow, I want to blow up Instagram. You know what? Yeah, I'll work off Mark Zuckerberg because he's this like great guy who's going to help me build it up. I just don't see that as being true. So that's just the point that I am just the least convinced. And y'all are not advocates. It's not your job to convince me. Uh, But could you all just respond to the more meta narrative? I'm just, I just think that's the weakest part of the case right now. I think that's so smart, Marshall. I think the monopoly argument is a lot of work right now. I think the monopoly argument is, is meant to, to solve so many other problems right now in Washington when it comes to disinformation, misinformation. It's just, it's really an astute point. And also these companies are all so different. They all have different business models. So it's like, I think the sentiment is there. I mean, that's like, that's, we've known that for months, many, many months now that the the anger is there and the backlash towards tech, how this is actually executed in terms of reigning in these companies in practice, it's like, it's really going to be tricky. And the courts essentially said, to your point, the very first question, you haven't even defined clearly and convincingly that it is a monopoly. Show your homework. When you say something's a monopoly, tell us what it, that looks like. So, yeah. I mean, I think that there's, there's, you're going to see some pushback aside from the political conversation mm-hmm. in Washington. 
I no, I absolutely. And I, I remember every time, you know, I have friends who are like, we're going to break up big tech. I'm like, guys, Facebook is a social media company. Twitter is a news aggregator, which is like 7% market share. Apple is a hardware company. Uh, and Amazon is a online shopping store. It's like, these are not the same. They are completely different business models. Uh, Shira, this is kind of my question from you from a more Silicon Valley perspective and kind of relates to what I just said, which is that Facebook is a, what, they have a trillion dollar market cap. They're raking in all this money. What do, do, what do people in Silicon Valley think when they consider the future of tech? Like, is Facebook a part of that conversation? Is Amazon or are they kind of bygones that have, they made all their money, but we're moving on. Like, where are they in the conversation? No, I mean, they're absolutely in the center of conversation. If you're a young Silicon Valley company, you're still modeling yourself after Amazon and Facebook, right? That is still the way they've right. done business. The, the, I hate to say it, but the, the, the move fast and break things, that is still very key to the founder startup ethos. And you all you have to do is go to one of these incubators and hear the, the aspiring young startup founders talk about their visions. And, you know, they hang on every word that Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos say about how they do business. I think a lot of Facebook's problems, a lot of the problems in tech companies right now is, is that, right? It's all about scaling and growth. And if you need to burn money to get there, you burn money to get there. And you really deal with your privacy and security and other problems later. I just wanted to add one thing to Cecilia's previous point, which is like, yes, antitrust, that, that's it. That's like, it's become a catch-all, right? Like, let's talk about monopoly. It's so much harder to talk about mm -hmm. misinformation and disinformation. It's so much harder to say, okay, we're a society that values free speech, but do we need limitations on or de define even what free speech is in the age of the internet? Do we create stricter laws about things like, for instance, you know, vo you know, disenfranchising voters? Like that is a much more nuanced and complicated conversation to have here in Washington. You know, do you say, okay, we believe in free speech, but if that speech tells people, you know, gets people to not vote by by misinforming them or gets people to act dangerously in a time of a pandemic, do we need to, to, to figure out other, you know, ways to define what our free speech is? That is a very difficult and hard conversation. There are no easy answers in it, but that's the age we're in. And that's a conversation that's applicable to all of the, well, except for maybe Apple, um, to the other companies you just mentioned, you know, look at the top books on Amazon. There's regularly books on Amazon that are sold and products on Amazon that are part of the misinformation ecosystem and campaign. This touches on all of these companies. I think that the U.S. has to start thinking in a more nuanced and complex way about it. Yeah. So here's my well, last actual question oh, for ahead, the two Marshall. of you, because yeah. it directly speaks to what you just said. Um, we've had Senator Josh Hawley on the show. We've had J.D. Vance on the show, and they are very explicit about believing that the conversation around misinformation and disinformation is just fundamentally in bad faith. And ultimately, this is just about power. Mm -hmm. So the thing that they will cite is- Power for who? The, sorry? Power for who? Well, power, power, basically power for, a center, for the center left and, institu center left, and institutions yeah. that lean, not like left as in progressive, but just sort of, once again, like the, the whole point of our show, The Realignment, is this idea that society's polarizing around education and class in those different directions. So just the thing that it's so hard, I mean, um, Cecilia, you made the point about studies show this, this, and that mm -hmm. thing about um, censorship. I mean, the problem is if you're a right-leaning person in this country, it's not the 80s anymore when Ronald Reagan won high college graduates, the studies are run by institutions that, yeah. you know, it's probably from the Neiman lab at Harvard or it's like, probably at the MIT the media. Lab. So like, right. it just goes on and on and on. And there's just so little, so I, I just want to hear, um, what would you say to people who think this entire conversation is probably just in bad faith and it's really about assuming political power and defeating their enemies? Because the one last thing I'll add here is that J.D. and Senator Hawley will explicitly say, we on the right need to wield power the same way. So we need to say, look, who cares what this philosophical debate around speech is? Who cares what Section 230 is trying to do? We need to use power the same way the center left uses power. So I'm just curious what y'all's response is to that for mm -hmm. our last cue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of curious what that would look like, first of all, um, for them using power. Um, Oh, so quick example. I mean, yeah. this is once again these these conversations are nascent, so they're not quite yeah. coherent. So treat them directionally. Yeah, I, I had a friend who is um, at a prominent, well-funded uh, conservative organization. He said, "Look, if I were in Congress right now, and we're telling this to congressmen, we lobby. They need to support breaking up Google, not because there's this like Borkian 
history of this, this and that. It's like people at that company are enemies. People at Apple are going to oppose trans bathroom, are going to like oppose trans bathroom laws in North Carolina, Indiana. So we need to go after these people because they're our political opponents. And because we don't control corporations, because we don't see ourselves as dominating in these other spheres, we have to use the power of the state. So that's, that's what they're saying. I totally get it. Can I, I just want to note one quick thing, and then I'm going to throw this to Cecilia. But you know, Facebook tried to run, did run an internal study on this. They hired a Republican senator, Senator John Kyle, who was given the really the first and most comprehensive access to their own platforms to see if there was any legitimacy to claims of conservative bias, and he found that there was not. And that report, you know, including its methodologies on Facebook's platform, I think that you know people people often cite, you know, why should we trust a study from NYU? Why should we trust a study from? name a left-wing leaning institution. And I would point that, you know, we haven't seen studies from, from, you know, any institution along the political spectrum that has conclusively shown conservative bias. Mm. Just the one quick thing to add to that, but that, that actually gets to what's fascinating here. No one on the right that I'm talking about gives a damn what Senator Kyle says. Yeah. That's the, like that, he's that, a libertarian. That, that's, that's, the politi- that's the political dilemma we're in, right? Like that's that's the post 2015 well, Republican Party. I mean, it, it, it almost feels a little bit more, um, <laughs> like a little adjacent sort of like the, the problem, what, what you're describing, which is there's so much um, lack of trust and lack of faith, as you're saying, there's just like such between the parties. I, okay. So on the other side as well, the left would say, oh, well, Holly is just using this as a political plank because this mm-hmm. is like his road to the white house, you know, like that's, it's, it's so, it's so politicized. One thing that I think we try to do in our book is to show that once Facebook decided to play in that sandbox of politics, of trying to be neutral, which was just sort of a fool's, you know, chase, it would just, it's impossible because once you start playing politics on either side, there's, you just get caught up in the mud fight. You know, I'm sorry, I'm mixing so many metaphors. You get just caught up in this, right? And it's, um, um, there's some self-inflicted damage on Facebook's part because of that. Um, There is no goodwill from either party because of that. Um, Like I can't answer for you what the motivations are of JD Vance and Josh Hawley. I don't know what's in their heads. I also don't know what the motivations are of like their counterparts on the left, you know, but I will say that right now it has become such a politicized conversation. This is like, not even policy at this point, yes. it's not even issues. And um, I think it's going to be really hard to get out of it. But interestingly, because politicians can sometimes be quite astute on strategy, they realize that there is there, there lies a sheer goal of some sort of action that works well, if you believe this is politics, works well for their constituencies on both sides. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We really appreciate you joining us, guys. I learned a lot from the book. Um, can you guys just, if you, if you have a preferred place to buy it, just let everybody know. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I love politics and prose in Washington, and I love The Strand in New York. Oh, love The Strand. All right, cool. All right, officially friends of the show forever. Okay, guys. <laughs> Uh, we really appreciate it. It'll be available on our bookshop as well. Helps an independent bookstore. All of that. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, Thanks. Thank you for, having you for all your great questions. Take yeah. care, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.